American schools have forgotten to teach our children one of the most important courses of all, investing. This is a glaring omission. History we teach, but not the part about the great march of capitalism and the role that companies have played in improving our lives. Math we teach, but not the part about how simple arithmetic could help us figure out whether or not a company will succeed or fail and how we might profit from owning shares of its stock. Home economics we teach, how to sew, how to cook a turkey, even how to stick to a budget and balance a checkbook. But what's left out is how saving money from an early age is the key to future prosperity, how investing that money in stocks is the best move a person can make, next to owning a house, and how the earlier you start saving and investing in stocks, the better you'll do in the long run. Investing is fun. It's interesting. Learning about it can be an enriching experience in more ways than one. It can put you on the road to prosperity for the rest of your life. The millions of Americans who have discovered the fun and profit in owning stocks aren't all whiz-bangs who drive Rolls Royces, like the people you see on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Most of these shareholders are regular folks with regular jobs. Teachers, bus drivers, doctors, carpenters, students, your friends and relatives, the neighbors in the next apartment, or down the block. In our society, it's the men who've handled most of the finances, and the women who stood by and watched men botching it up. There's nothing about investing that a woman can't do as well as a man, and you don't get the knack for it through the genes. So when you hear someone say, he's a natural-born investor, don't believe it. The natural-born investor is a myth. The principles of finance are simple and easily grasped. Principle number one is that savings equals investment. Money that you keep in a piggy bank or cookie jar doesn't count as an investment. But any time you put money in the bank or buy a savings bond or buy stock in a company, you're investing. Somebody else will take that money and use it to build new stores, new factories, all of which create jobs. More jobs means more paychecks for more workers. If those workers can manage to set aside some of their earnings to save and invest, the whole process begins all over again. The best time to get started investing is when you're young. The more time you have to let your investments grow, the bigger the fortune you'll end up with. But this introduction to finance is not only for young people. It's for beginning investors of all ages who find stocks confusing and who haven't had the chance to learn about them. Before we go any further, I want to stress again the importance of saving on a regular basis and starting young, whether it's $50, $100, or $500 a month. Consider the following two cases, Joe Big Belly and Sally Cartwheel. Big Belly gets a job as a clerk at Walmart. He's living at home and saving every last dollar so he can make the $2,000 down payment on a $20,000 Camaro with a racing scoop on the hood. He takes out a car loan for the remaining $18,000. His parents have to sign for the loan, but Big Belly is making the payments. It's a six-year loan at 10% interest, so he sends $200 a month to the finance company. He cringes the first time he seals the envelope, kissing $200 goodbye, but he forgets all about it when he's driving around the Camaro and his friends are telling him what a cool car it is. A few months later, there are scratches on the door and stains on the carpet, and nobody is ooing and aahing when the Camaro pulls into the parking lot. It's just another car by now, but Big Belly is stuck with the payments. At the end of six years, he's sick of the Camaro, which lost its cool a long time ago. He's finally paid off the car loan, which cost him an extra 10800 in interest charges, so between the loan and the original purchase price, Big Belly has invested $30,800 in this car, not including taxes, insurance, gas, oil, and maintenance. At this point, the Camaro has more dents and more stains, and the engine sounds a bit rough. So what he's got to show for his $30,800 investment is a $6,000 clunker that he doesn't even like anymore. Sally Cartwheel also lives at home and works the Walmart checkout line a few feet away from Big Belly. But she didn't buy a cool car. She took the $2,000 she saved up and bought a used Ford Escort. Since Sally paid all cash, she didn't have car payments. So instead of sending $200 a month to the finance company, she invested $200 a month in a mutual fund for stocks. Six years later, 
when Big Belly was mailing out his last car payment, the value of Cartwheel's mutual fund had doubled. Between the doubling of the fund itself and the steady stream of $200 contributions to the fund, Cartwheel has a $22,000 asset. She also has the escort, which got her back and forth okay, and the dents and the stains she never worried about, because she didn't think of her car as an investment. It was only transportation. As we leave this economic morality tale, Cartwheel has enough money to make a down payment on an apartment and move out of her parents' home, while Big Belly continues to mooch. He's asked her out on a date, but she's taken a fancy to the real estate agent who's showing her around. America was once a nation of savers. People of all income levels put aside as much money as they could, mostly in savings accounts at the local bank. They made money on this money as it grew with interest, so eventually they could use it for a down payment on a house, or to buy things, or to draw on in family emergencies. In the meantime, the bank could take people's savings and lend them out to home buyers, or home builders, or businesses of all kinds. A country with a high savings rate can pay for roads, phone lines, factories, equipment, and all the latest innovations that help companies make better and cheaper products to sell to the world. An example is Japan. Japan was nearly ruined by World War II, but it managed to bounce back and become a great economic power. Japan was able to revamp its industries and rebuild its cities and towns because of its high savings rates. It's still a nation of savers today. The U.S. has a lot of catching up to do in this area because we no longer save the way we once did. While we put aside 5% of our income every year, the people of Japan, Thailand, Hong Kong, Singapore, China, and many other countries are saving 10% or more. We lead the world in credit cards and in borrowing money to pay for things we want right away but can't quite afford. Save as much as you can. Start when you're young. You'll be helping yourself and helping the country. The stock market offers each of us a terrific way to do both of those things. Save and invest in the country. But to win at this game, you have to understand how it's played. Let's begin with the basics. The vast majority of businesses in this country, from barber shops to bowling alleys, are privately owned by individuals, families, or small groups of people. You can't invest in them. But the biggest companies in America are almost all publicly owned. That means anybody can call up a broker and buy a share. Even if the chairman of McDonald's holds a grudge against you, he can't stop you from becoming an owner of McDonald's. The same goes for over 13,000 other public companies in the U.S. today. Public companies are everywhere. They surround you from morning to night. You can't get away from them. Nike, Chrysler, The Gap, Sunglass Hut, Kodak, Walmart... These are all public companies. Maybe you eat the school lunch that's cooked on an Amana radar range made by Raytheon. That's the same public company that makes the Patriot missile. Or maybe you drive to the nearest publicly owned hamburger joint, McDonald's, Wendy's, or Burger King, which is a division of a British public company called Grand Metropolitan. Coke and Pepsi come from public companies, and Pepsi also owns Taco Bell. From sea to shining sea, over 50 million men, women, and children have become part owners in public companies. This is an important part of our way of life that the Founding Fathers couldn't have dreamed up. Investors are the first link in the capitalist chain that creates our prosperity. In fact, investors got this country started. The history books give many reasons for America's great success, from the favorable climate to the tenacity of the first settlers. But behind the scenes, somebody had to pay the bills for the ships, the food, and the other expenses of coming to the New World. Most of this money came out of the pockets of the English, Dutch, and French investors. Without them, the colonies would never have gotten colonized. For example, it was the Virginia Company which footed the bill for the first expedition to Jamestown, where Pocahontas saved John Smith from having his head bashed in by her angry relatives. And later, in the mid-1800s, it was again foreign capital 
that help bankroll our fantastic progress as an emerging market. Today, we are returning the favor. American capital helps the world economy to grow, especially the emerging markets in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. It did not take long for capitalism to take root in America. By the early 1700s, companies of many types were getting started in the colonies. A few are still operating today. This is an amazing feat when you think of all the calamities between then and now. J.E. Rhodes, for example, has been around since 1702 when it began manufacturing buggy whips. Clever managers saw the age of the machine coming and switched to making conveyor belts. The D. Landreff Seed Company has been around since 1784. It sold seeds to Thomas Jefferson. If a company makes a good product that never goes out of date, it can stay in business forever. While there were businesses in colonial America, there were no banks. The British did not allow them. After the revolution, this problem was corrected. In spite of the opposition from Thomas Jefferson, a gentleman farmer who dreaded banks, Alexander Hamilton got approval for the first bank of the United States in 1791. We all recognize George Washington as the father of our country, but Alexander Hamilton was the father of the financial system. Hamilton's more famous for being a bad shot, losing a duel to Aaron Burr, but he was an astute economic planner. Hamilton also helped found the Bank of New York, still listed on the New York Stock Exchange. But the earliest shareholders in American banks, knowing little about what they were buying, paid too much for many of their bank stocks. The bidding went higher and higher until it got to ridiculous prices. And on Wall Street, what goes up that high must come down. Bank stocks landed with a thud in the crash of 1792, the first crash in Wall Street history. Hamilton's idea of a federally sponsored bank went out of favor after another panic in 1819, when a lot of businesses went bankrupt and people lost their life savings and jobs. President Andrew Jackson transferred the government's money to various state banks. The states, which gave out charters, in time created a vast system of banks, 300 in 1820, over 10,000 today. At the time of American independence from England, markets were opening all over the place. People were buying and selling at a furious pace. To many people, the whole situation looked out of control. Never in history were the masses of people allowed to go their own way and work for their own benefit. There didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. Enter the economists, a new breed of thinkers. The first and smartest was Adam Smith. His Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, the year America declared independence, made the case for economic freedom. Smith deserves a place in history along with Tom Paine, Benjamin Franklin, and John Locke, who made the case for political freedom. Smith argued that when each person pursues his own line of work, the population is far better off than with a king or central planner dictating who gets what. This seems obvious today, but in 1776, it was a novel idea that millions of people could do what they pleased and somehow still create an orderly society where everyone was fed and housed. What if 99 out of 100 wanted to make hats? This is where Smith's invisible hand comes to the rescue. There is no invisible hand, of course. That was how Smith explained the ability of supply and demand to keep goods and services in balance. Too many hats? Prices drop. Hat makers go out of business and switch to a line of work that's profitable, like vegetable farming. The invisible hand doesn't work perfectly, of course, but Smith's ideas still hold true today. When there's a need for a new product, such as computers, many companies go into the business, until there's so many computers that the price drops. The competition helps the consumer because every few months, fantastic new products come out to replace the clunky old ones. We don't need a king or a congress or a department of things to decide what the country should make and how many. The market system that Smith described works this out automatically, and the profit motive supplies the incentive for people to work and corporations to be productive. Companies are in business for one basic reason, 
no matter if they're private or public, owned by a single shareholder or a million shareholders, the goal is the same. They want to make a profit. Profit is the money that's left over after all the bills are paid. It can be divided among the owners of any business, whether it's General Electric, Pepsi-Cola, Marvel Comics, or the car wash you run on weekends in your driveway. You wouldn't want to stand out in the hot sun with a bucket and soapy sponge if you didn't expect to come away with a profit. Maybe you enjoy washing cars because you can hose yourself down every once in a while. It keeps you cool in the summertime. But that doesn't mean you do it for free. The same is true of people who own shares in companies. They're not doing it just for the fun of getting invited to the annual meeting or getting a copy of the annual report sent to them in the mail. They're doing it because they expect the company in which they own shares to make a profit and pass along some of that profit to them sooner or later. There's a mistaken idea still floating around that people who do things for profit are being greedy or underhanded. And they're trying to pull a fast one on the rest of us. Because whenever one person makes a bundle, it's at the expense of everybody else. A generation ago, there were more believers in this idea than there are today. But it's still lurking in the backs of more than a few minds. That one man's gain is another man's pain was the basic doctrine of communism. It was also fashionable among socialists on college campuses and elsewhere, who never missed a chance to accuse capitalists of putting themselves first and everybody else last, and of getting rich on the sore backs of the wage earners. Capitalism is not a zero-sum game. Except for a few crooks, the rich do not get that way by making other people poor. When the rich get richer, the poor get richer as well. If we're really true that the rich get richer at the expense of the poor, then since we're the richest country in the world, by now we surely would have created the most desperate class of poor people on earth. Instead, we've done just the opposite. Even corporate layoffs, which are painful to the individual, are healthy in the larger scheme of things. Back in the 1980s, the top 500 corporations found they had to get leaner and more competitive to survive. Three million workers were dropped from the payrolls. But without these changes, millions and millions more would have lost their jobs. The bloated payrolls would have destroyed these companies. Meanwhile, small firms were creating jobs. Over two million new businesses were started in the 1980s. If they employ an average of 10 people each, that creates seven times the jobs lost and the well-publicized layoffs of the bigger corporations. And often, the small companies have become larger ones, employing not 10, but thousands of people. In spite of everything you might hear about layoffs or America losing its place in the world, remember that our economy has enormous strengths. We are the low-cost producers in forest products, paper, aluminum, and chemicals. Believe it or not, our railroads are so good at moving cargo that other countries are studying how we do it. Our auto firms have made a stunning comeback. We're number one in pharmaceuticals, farm equipment, commercial airplane production, telecommunications, music, television, movies. In software, workstations, laser printers, computer networks, and microprocessors, the U.S. is dominant. The Japanese and Europeans can't keep up with the brainstorms that are coming out of such firms as Intel, Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, Apple, and Compaq Computer. Meanwhile, the supposedly slothful U.S. labor force has become the most productive in the world, each industrial worker producing nearly $50,000 worth of goods, $10,000 more than the average Japanese. All this innovation and productivity has been led by a different kind of American hero. Not all the heroes are ball players and rock stars. The people who start new companies and turn around older ones are also heroes. There's Steve Jobs, who created Apple Computer, which started in a garage, and Bill Gates, who created Microsoft. There's Walt Disney, the founding hero of Disney, and Michael Eisner, who brought back the full-length animation movies that gave Disney such box office hits as The Lion King and Beauty and the Beast. There's Lee Iacocca, who saved the Chrysler Corporation, Jack Welch at General Electric, Robert Goitsueda at Coca-Cola, 
David Maxwell, who revived Fannie Mae, the largest mortgage corporation in the United States, and Fred Smith, who started Federal Express. Smith started FedEx not because he wanted to be rich. He was already rich. He did it for the challenge. In teaching the post office a lesson in how to deliver mail, he created jobs and helped the country. When you decide to save your money by putting it in the stock market, you invest in these kinds of heroes and the companies they lead. But what does it mean exactly to become a stockholder in a public company? Let's look at that question carefully. When you buy a stock, you become an owner of a company with all the rights and privileges. Invest in McDonald's, and they make a fuss over you. They send you their reports, and they invite you to their annual meetings. They also pay you a bonus in the form of a dividend. If they have a really good year at their over 10,000 hamburger stands, they might raise the dividend. So you get even a bigger bonus. But even without the dividend, if McDonald's sells another zillion Big Macs and all goes well, the stock price will rise. You can sell your stock for more than you paid for it and make money that way. Of course, there are no guarantees that McDonald's will prosper and that you'll get a bonus or that the stock price will rise. If it falls to less than what you paid for it, McDonald's will not reimburse you. They haven't promised anything, and they're not obliged to pay you back. As an owner of the stock, you don't have a safety net. You must proceed at your own risk. Nonetheless, stocks are likely to be the best investment you'll ever make outside of a house. 10 to 11% a year is what you can expect for a total return from stocks on average over the very long term. When people consistently lose money in stocks, it's not the fault of the stocks. Stocks in general go up in value over time. In 99 cases out of 100, when investors are chronic losers, it's because they don't have a plan. They buy at a high price, then they get impatient or they panic, and they sell at a lower price during one of those inevitable periods when stocks are taking a dive. Instead, you need a plan. It should be for the long term. Have you heard the old expression, time is money? It ought to be revised to, time makes money. It's a winning combination. Let time and money do the work while you sit back and await the results. People who need to pull their money out in one year, two years, or five years shouldn't invest in stocks in the first place. There's simply no telling what stock prices will do from one year to the next. When the stock market has one of its corrections and stocks lose money, the people who have to get their money out will be going home with a lot less than they put in. 20 years or longer is the right time frame. That's long enough for stocks to rebound from the nastiest corrections on record, and it's long enough for the profits to pile up. After 20 years at 11%, an investment of $10,000 is magically transformed into over $80,000. But to get that 11%, you have to pledge your loyalty to stocks for better or for worse. This is a marriage we're talking about, a marriage between your money and your investments. You can be a genius in analyzing which companies to buy, but unless you have the patience and the courage to hold on to the shares, you're an odds-on favorite to become a mediocre investor. It's not brain power that separates good investors from bad, it's discipline. Stick with your stocks no matter what. Ignore all the smart advice that tells you to do otherwise and act like a dumb mule. That was the advice given years ago by an ex-stockbroker, Fred Schwed, in his classic book, Where Are the Customer's Yachts? And it still applies today. People are always looking around for the secret formula for winning on Wall Street, when all along it's staring them in the face. Buy shares in solid companies with earning power, and don't let go of them without a good reason. The stock price going down is not a good reason. It's easy enough to stand in front of a mirror and swear that you're a long-term investor who will have no trouble staying true to your stocks. Ask any group of people how many are long-term investors, and you'll see a unanimous show of hands. These days, it's hard to find anybody who doesn't claim to be a long-term investor. But the real test comes when stocks take a dive. Nobody can predict exactly when a bear market will arrive although there's no shortage of Wall Street types who claim to be skilled fortune tellers. 
But when one does arrive, and the prices of 9 out of 10 stocks drop in unison, many investors naturally get scared. It's at this point that large crowds of people suddenly become short-term investors, in spite of their claims about being long-term investors. They let their emotions get the better of them, and they forget all the reasons they bought stocks in the first place, to own shares in good companies. They go into a panic because stock prices are low. Instead of waiting for the prices to come back, they sell at these low prices. Nobody forces them to do this, but they volunteer to lose money. Without realizing it, they've fallen into the trap of trying to time the market. If you told them they were market timers, they'd deny it. But anybody who sells stocks because the market's up or down is a market timer for sure. A market timer tries to predict the short-term zigs and zags in stock prices, hoping to get out with a quick profit. Few people can make money at this, and no one has come up with a foolproof method. In fact, if anybody had figured out how to consistently predict the market, his name or her name would already appear at the top of the list of the richest people in the world, ahead of Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. Try to time the market, and you invariably find yourself getting out of stocks at the moment they've hit bottom and are turning back up, and into stocks when they've gone up and are turning back down. People think this happens to them because they're unlucky. In fact, it happens to them because they're attempting the impossible. Nobody can outsmart the market. People also think it's dangerous to be investing in stocks during crashes and corrections. But it's only dangerous if they sell. They forget the other kind of danger. Not being invested in stocks on those few magical days when prices take a flying leap. It's amazing how few key days can make or break your entire investment plan. Here's a typical example. During a prosperous five-year stretch in the 1980s, stock prices gained 26.3% a year. Disciplined investors who stuck to a plan doubled their money and then some. But most of these gains occurred on 40 days out of the 1,276 days the stock market was open for business during those five years. If you were out of stocks in those 40 key days, attempting to avoid the next correction, your 26.3% annual gain was reduced to only 4.3%. A CD in a bank would return more than 4.3% and at no risk. So to get the most out of stocks, especially if you're young and time is on your side, your best bet is to invest money you can afford to set aside forever. Then leave that money in stocks through thick and thin. You'll suffer through the bad times, but if you don't sell any shares, you'll never take a real loss. By being fully invested, you'll get the full benefit of these magical and unpredictable stretches when stocks make most of their gains. At this point, we've come to two conclusions. One, you should invest in stocks if at all possible. And two, you should hold on to them no matter what. The next thing you have to decide is whether to pick your own stocks or let somebody else do it. There's a lot to be said for taking the easy way out especially if you are bored by numbers and you couldn't care less what happens to Codex earnings or if Nike makes a better shoe than Reebok. That's why mutual funds were invented. Mutual funds are for people who want to own stocks but can't be bothered with the details. In a mutual fund, your only job is to send money, which gives you a certain number of shares in the fund. Your money is lumped together with a lot of other people's money. You never actually meet them, but you know they are out there. The whole pile is handed over to the expert who manages the fund. At least you hope there's an expert in charge because you're counting on him or her to figure out which stocks to buy and when to buy them and sell them. A mutual fund has another advantage. Besides having a manager who does all the work, it invests in many companies at once. As soon as you sign up with a fund, you automatically become an owner of the dozens, even hundreds of companies the fund has already bought. Whether you invest $50 or $50 million, you still own a piece of all the stocks in the fund. This is less risky than owning only one stock, which, if you're a novice investor, might be all you can afford. A typical fund allows you to get started with as little as $50 or $100, with a chance to buy more shares whenever extra cash comes into your possession. How much and how often you contribute is up to you. You can take the guesswork out of it by investing the same amount every month, three months, or six months. 
The interval isn't important as long as you keep up the routine. This is called dollar cost averaging. Can you see the wisdom in this sort of installment plan? Your worries about where the stock market is headed from one year to the next are over. In a correction or a bear market, the shares in your favorite fund will get cheaper. So you'll be buying more at low prices. And in a bull market, you'll be buying less at high prices. Over time, with consistent investment, the costs will even out and your profits will mount. As an added attraction, many funds pay a cash bonus in the form of a dividend. It comes your way on a regular basis, four times a year, twice a year, or even 12 times a year. You can spend this money on movie tickets to reward yourself for investing in the fund. Or you can do yourself a bigger favor by using the dividend to buy more shares. This is called the reinvestment option. And once you've chosen it, your dividends are reinvested automatically. The more shares you own, the more you stand to gain from the future success of the fund, which is why your money will grow faster if you throw the dividends into the pot. You can follow your fund's progress by looking it up in the newspaper, the same way you look up the stock price of Disney or Wendy's. The price of a share in a fund goes up and down every day, and it moves more or less in lockstep with the prices of all the stocks in the fund's portfolio. That's why you want to invest in funds with managers who have the knack for picking the right stocks. You're rooting for the managers, because the better they do, the better you do. Saying goodbye to a fund is easy. You can take your money out at any time you want, either all of it or some of it, and the fund will send you a check immediately. But unless there's an emergency, and you have a sudden need for quick cash, getting out of a fund should be the last thing on your mind. Your goal is to sell your shares for a much higher price than the price you paid to acquire them. And the longer you stick with the fund, the bigger your potential profit. Along with the chance to share in the gains from a fund, you're also paying a share of the expenses. Salaries, rent, printing, mailing, telephone bills, all the costs of running a fund. These and other expenses are paid out of the fund's assets, and they cost investors between a half a percent and two percent annually, depending on the fund. Funds with expenses less than 1% have a built-in advantage over funds with bigger tabs. In addition to taking the annual expenses out of the shareholder's assets, some funds charge an entry fee called a load. These days, the average load is 3 to 4%. That means whenever you invest in a fund with a load, you lose 3 to 4% of your money right off the bat. The longer you stay in a fund, the less important the load becomes. Annual expenses deserve more attention than the load because they are taken out of the fund every year. For all the funds that charge an entry fee, there are just as many funds that don't. These are the no-loads. As it turns out, the no-loads perform just as well on average as the funds with loads. This is one case where paying a cover charge doesn't necessarily get you into a classier joint. Classy joint or not, professional stock pickers do have an advantage over the millions of amateurs who do their own stock picking. It's a hobby for the amateurs, but for the pros, it's a full-time job. They go to business school to learn how to study companies and decipher financial reports. They've got libraries, high-performance computers, and a research department to back them up. If there's important news out of a company, they hear it right away. It would take a dozen audio cassettes like this one to describe the different kinds of stock funds that are out there. The all-purpose funds, single industry funds, multi-industry, small company, large company, pure, hybrid, foreign, domestic, socially conscious, socially unconscious, growth, value, income, and growth and income funds. It's gotten so complicated, there are funds of funds that specialize in buying shares and other funds. You could stay up day and night studying how to choose the right fund, and you wouldn't get through half the information that's been printed on the subject. If all these how-to books, pamphlets, and articles fell on top of you, it would take a rescue squad several hours to pull you out. You can buy mutual funds directly from the companies that manage them, such as Dreyfus, Fidelity, Scudder, etc. You can also buy them through a stockbroker, although a broker may not be able to sell you the fund that you want. Brokers have to make a living. They sometimes get a bigger commission for selling the firm's own products. Convincing you to buy one of their own in-house mutual funds may be in their best interest, 
but not necessarily in yours. Whenever a broker recommends anything, always find out what's in it for the broker. Ask him or her to provide information on the full range of what's available. There might be a fund that's similar to the one he's recommending, but has a better record overall. If you're a long-term investor, ignore all the bond funds and hybrid funds. These invest in a mixture of stocks and bonds, and go instead for the pure stock funds. Stocks have outperformed bonds in eight of the nine decades in this century, and are way ahead in the first half of the decade of the 1990s. If you're not 100% invested in stocks, you're shortchanging yourself in the long run. Picking a fund ought to be easier than picking an auto mechanic. When an auto mechanic claims to be the best in the business, you have no way of telling if he is or he isn't. But you can find out right away which funds are the best. It all boils down to one number, the annual return. A fund that returned 18% a year to its investors in the last decade is better than a fund with similar objectives that returned only 14%. Before you invest in a fund on the strength of its record, make sure the manager who compiled the great record is still in charge. Why take a chance on a rookie fund when you can invest in a veteran fund that's been around through several seasons and has turned in an all-star performance? A list of funds that have stayed on top over many years can be found in financial magazines such as Barron's and Forbes. Twice a year, Barron's publishes a complete roundup of the funds, with the details provided by Lipper Analytical, a high-quality research company run by a prominent fund watcher, Michael Lipper. The Wall Street Journal publishes a similar roundup four times a year. If you want more information about a particular fund, you can get it from Morningstar, a company that tracks thousands of funds and issues a monthly report. Morningstar ranks all the funds for safety, rates their performance, and tells who the manager is and what stocks are in the portfolio. It's the best one-stop source in existence today. Over time, it's been more profitable to invest in small companies than large companies. The successful small companies of today will become the Walmarts, Home Depots, and Microsofts of tomorrow. It's no wonder, then, that mutual funds that invest in small companies have beaten out other funds by a substantial margin. A couple of stocks like Walmart is all a mutual fund needs to outperform the competition. That one stock is up more than 600-fold in 20 years. Since small company stocks are generally more volatile than large ones, you'll need a strong stomach that can take the bumps and stay on the ride. You'll do better in mutual funds that invest in small companies. And take note, it doesn't pay to be a fund jumper. Some investors make a hobby of switching from one fund to another, hopping the bandwagon of the latest hot performer. This is more trouble than it's worth. Studies have shown that top-ranked funds from one year rarely repeat their performance to the next. Trying to catch the winner is a fool's errand in which you're likely to end up with a loser. You're better off picking a fund with an excellent long-term record and sticking with it. Some investors have given up trying to find a fund that beats the averages. Instead, they choose a fund that is guaranteed to match the average, no matter what. This kind of fund is called an index fund. It doesn't need a manager. It runs an automatic pilot. It simply buys all the stocks in a particular index and holds on to them. There's no fuss, no experts to pay, no management fees to speak of, no commissions for getting in and out of different stocks, and no decisions to make. For instance, an S&P 500 index fund buys all 500 stocks in the Standard & Poor's 500 index, a diversified basketful of large stocks. This S&P 500 index is a well-known market average. So when you invest in such a fund, you'll always get an average result, which, based on recent past performance, will be a better result than you get in many of the managed funds. Or if you decide to invest in what's called a small cap fund to take advantage of the big potential payoffs from small companies, you can buy a Russell 2000 index fund. That way, your money will be spread out among the 2000 stocks in the Russell. Another possibility is to put some of your money into an S&P 500 index fund to get the gains from the larger companies, and then put the rest in a Russell index fund to get the gains from the smaller companies. 
That way, you'll never have to read another article about how to pick a winning mutual fund. And you will end up doing better than some of the people who studied the situation very carefully and then put themselves in funds that failed to beat the averages. Mutual funds are just right for millions of investors. If you have the time and the inclination, you can embark on a thrilling lifetime adventure, picking your own stocks. This is a lot more work than investing in a mutual fund, but you can derive a great deal of satisfaction from picking your own stocks. Over time, perhaps you'll do better than most of the funds. Not all your stocks will work to your advantage. No stock picker in history has ever had a 100% success ratio. Even wealthy stock picker Warren Buffett has made numerous mistakes, and I could fill several spiral notebooks with stories of mine. But a few big winners every decade is all you need. If you own 10 stocks, and three of them are big winners, they will more than make up for one or two losers and six or seven stocks that have done okay, but not great. Once you get the hang of how to follow a company's progress, you can begin to plow more money into the successful companies and reduce your stake in the flops. Actually, there's nothing to keep you from investing in mutual funds and buying your own stocks as well. Many investors do both. In fact, stock picking may be America's number one hobby, although it's rarely thought of that way. Many of the bits of advice you learn before in the mutual fund section, such as the advantages of starting early, of having a plan, of sticking to the plan, and not worrying about crashes and corrections, also apply to the portfolio of stocks you pick on your own. A problem confronts you right away. How do I figure out which stocks to pick? You'd be surprised how many people lose money by investing in stocks before they know the first thing about them. It happens all the time. A person goes through life with no experience in investing, then suddenly receives a lump sum retirement benefit and throws it all into the stock market, blind, when he can't tell a dividend from a divot. Since it's dangerous to put money into stocks before you figure out how to pick them, you might as well put yourself through some practice drills before you risk your cash. You've heard of fantasy baseball? That's where you pick an imaginary team from the major league rosters to test how your own team's batting average, home run production, etc. measure up. You can train for stock selection with a fantasy portfolio. Take an imaginary bankroll, $100,000 perhaps, and use it to buy shares in your favorite companies. Maybe you select Disney, Nike, Microsoft, Ben & Jerry's, and Pepsi. Track your gains and losses just the way you would with your own hard cash. To get the most out of your training sessions, you have to do more than follow the prices of the stocks. You have to learn as much as possible about the companies you've chosen and what makes them tick. This brings us to the five basic methods people use to pick a stock. Here's the rundown on each, beginning with the most ridiculous and ending with the most enlightened. Number one, the dart method, the lowest form of stock picking. You throw a dart at the stock page, and wherever it lands, you buy that stock. Maybe you'll get lucky, and you'll hit on a stock that does well, but maybe you won't. Method number two, hot tips, the second lowest form of stock picking where somebody else tells you to buy a stock that's a cinch to go up. It could be your best friend, your English teacher, your Uncle Harry, or maybe you overhear the tip on a bus. For some reason, overhearing a tip gets people more excited than if the tip were meant for them directly. It's possible that Uncle Harry is directly involved with a certain company and knows what he's talking about. That sort of informed tip can be useful, a clue that's worth investigating further. But the dangerous kind of hot tip is based on nothing but hot air. Here's a typical example. Home Shopping Network. The smart money is accumulating this stock. Buy right away, before it's too late. It looks like this sucker's going up. People who won't buy a $50 toaster oven without checking several stores for the best price will throw thousands of dollars at a hot tip such as Home Shopping Network. Method number three, educated tips. You get these from experts who appear on the TV or are quoted in newspapers and magazines. There's a constant stream of educated tips flowing out of the fund managers, investment advisors, and other Wall Street gurus. You're not the only person who's been let in on these educated tips. Millions of readers and listeners are hearing the same thing you are. Nevertheless, if you can't resist acting on a tip, you might as well take a tip from an expert and ignore Uncle Harry's tip. There's a decent chance the expert has done enough homework to form an educated opinion. 
whereas Uncle Harry doesn't know what he's talking about. Beyond, it looks like the sucker's going up. The problem with expert tips is when the expert changes his mind, you have no way of finding that out, unless he goes back on TV to inform the viewers and you happen to catch the show. Otherwise, you'll be holding on to the stock because you think the expert likes it long after he stopped liking it. Method 4. The Broker's Buy List Stockbrokers of the full-service variety are never shy about giving their recommendations on what stocks you should buy. Often these recommendations do not come from the broker's own head. They come from the analysts who work behind the scenes at the head office, usually in New York City. These are well-trained Sherlock's whose job is to snoop into the affairs of the companies or groups of companies. They issue buy signals and sell signals based on the evidence they dredge up. It is possible for you to build an excellent portfolio by working with a broker to pick stocks from the buy list. That way, you can rely on the brokerage firm's research and still get to choose which of the buys you like the best. This is one big advantage of relying on educated tips. If the brokerage firm changes its mind and moves one of your stocks from the buy list to the sell list, your broker will inform you of the fact. If he doesn't, then put the broker on your sell list. Method 5. Doing your own research. This is the highest form of stock picking. You choose the stock because you like the company, and you like the company because you studied it inside and out. The more you learn about investing in companies, the less you have to rely on other people's opinions, and the better you can evaluate other people's tips. You can decide for yourself what stocks to buy and when to buy them. You'll need two kinds of information, the kind you get by keeping your eyes peeled the kind you get by studying the numbers. The first kind, you can begin to gather every time you walk into a McDonald's, a Sunglass Hut, or any other store that's owned by a publicly traded company. And if you work in the store, so much the better. You can see for yourself whether or not the operation is efficient or sloppy, overstaffed or understaffed, well-organized or chaotic. You can gauge the morale of your fellow employees. You can get a sense of whether management is reckless or careful with money. If you're out front with the customers, you can size up the crowd. Are they lining up at the cash register, or does the place look dead? Are they happy with the merchandise, or do they complain a lot? These little details can tell you a great deal about the quality of the parent company itself. Have you ever seen a messy Gap or an empty McDonald's? The employees at any one of the Gap outlets or the McDonald's franchises could have noticed long ago how fantastically successful these operations have been and invested their spare cash accordingly. Even if you don't have a job in a publicly traded company, you can see what's going on from the customer's angle. Every time you shop in a store, eat a hamburger, or buy new sunglasses, you're getting valuable input. By browsing around, you can see what's selling and what isn't. By watching your friends, you know which computers they're buying, which brand of soda they're drinking, which movie they're watching, whether Reeboks are in or out. These are all important clues that can lead you to the right stocks. Once you start looking at the world through a stock picker's eyes, where everything is a potential investment, you begin to notice the companies that do business with the companies that got your attention in the first place. If you work in a hospital, you come into contact with companies that make sutures, surgical gowns, syringes, beds and bedpans, x-ray equipment, EKG machines, companies that help the hospital keep its costs down, companies that write the health insurance, companies that handle the billing. The grocery store is another hotbed of companies. Dozens of them are represented in each aisle. You will also begin to notice when a competitor is doing a better job than the company that hired you. When people were lining up to buy Chrysler minivans, it wasn't just the Chrysler salesman who realized that Chrysler was on the way back to making record profits. It was also the Buick salesman down the block who sat around their empty showroom and realized that a lot of Buick customers must have switched to Chrysler. This brings us to the numbers. Just because a company makes a popular product doesn't mean you should automatically buy the stock. There's a lot more you have to know before you invest. You have to know if the company is spending its cash wisely or frittering it away. You have to know how much it owes to the banks. You have to know if the sales are growing and how fast. You have to know how much money it earned in past years. You have to make your best estimate as to how much you can expect to earn in the future. You have to know if the stock is selling at a fair price, at bargain prices, or too high a price. You have to know if the company is paying a dividend, 
That is, does it regularly send a portion of its profits to you? And if so, how much? And how often is the dividend raised? Earnings, sales, debt, dividends, and the price of the stock. These are some of the key numbers stock pickers must follow. People go to graduate school to learn how to read and interpret these numbers. So this is not a subject that can be covered in depth in a primer such as this one. The best we can do is to give you a glimpse at the basic elements of a company's finances so you can begin to see how the numbers fit together. No investor can possibly hope to keep up with the over 13,000 companies whose stocks are traded in the U.S. markets today. That's why amateurs and pros alike are forced to cut down on their number of options by specializing in one kind of company or another. For instance, some investors only buy stocks in companies that have a habit of raising their dividends. Others look for companies where the earnings are growing by at least 20% a year. You can specialize in a certain industry, such as electric utilities, or restaurants, or banks. You can specialize in small companies or large companies, new companies or old companies. You can specialize in companies that have fallen on hard times and are trying to make a comeback. These are called turnarounds. There are hundreds of different ways to skin this cat. Investing is not an exact science. And no matter how hard you study the numbers and how much you learn about a company's past performance, you never can be sure about its future performance. What happens tomorrow is always a guess. Your job as an investor is to make educated guesses and not blind ones. Your job is to pick stocks and not pay too high a price for them relative to what they're going to earn in the next several years. Then to keep watching for good news or bad news coming out of the companies you own. You can use your knowledge to keep the risks to a minimum. At this point, potential investors, especially young students, will often ask, how do I get the money to invest in the first place? It's not just any cash that can be safely put into stocks. It's cash that you can afford to live without for many years while it goes forth and multiplies. If you're a young person and have a part-time job and can afford to invest a portion of your paycheck, so much the better. If not, perhaps you can drop some hints to family members around the holidays. Here's where parents, grandparents, aunts, or uncles can play a leading role. The greatest source of investment capital for young people is relatives. When they ask you what you want for your birthday, Christmas, Hanukkah, etc., tell them you want stocks. Let them know if it comes down to a choice between owning a new pair of Nikes or owning Nike, which costs about the same amount as the shoes, you'd rather have the shares. If they own shares themselves, they can get you started by simply transferring one share or many shares over to you. The paperwork is no problem. They don't have to pay a commission or a fee to do this. While small numbers of shares are routinely handed down from parents or grandparents, it's been difficult for young people to buy small numbers of shares on their own. Until recently, in fact, young investors have been discouraged from buying the one share or the few shares that would get them started investing. Two barriers stand in their way. First, most stock transactions are handled by brokers. and You can't open your own brokerage account until you're 21 years old. Second, most brokers charge minimum commissions, which range from $25 to $40. If you're buying one share of Pepsi for $47, you have to pay the broker a $40 commission. The fee is almost as expensive as the share. No successful investor can afford to pay $87 for a $47 stock. This sad state of affairs is changing, as companies have begun to sell small quantities of their own shares directly to the public, bypassing the brokers. After all, if McDonald's can sell you a burger, why shouldn't it be allowed to sell you its stock? Already, 80 companies have adopted a so-called direct investment program, in which individuals can purchase a few shares and pay commissions less than the deepest discount broker, or in a few cases, no commission at all. It's the best thing Wall Street has done for young people since the New York Stock Exchange invited the Beatles onto the floor in the 1960s. Unless you're buying shares directly from the company, you have to work through a broker at a brokerage house. You've heard the names Merrill Lynch, Smith Barney, Dean Witter, Payne Weber, Charles Schwab. Schwab is a living person, and Witter a deceased one. But the rest of these names are composites. There was a Mr. Merrill and a Mr. Lynch, a Mr. Smith and a Mr. Barney, a Mr. Payne and a Mr. Weber, 
and so forth. All brokerage houses handle stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and they all have to abide by the same rules laid down by the government. But beyond that, they are quite different. The so-called full-service brokers, such as Merrill Lynch or Smith Barney, charge higher commission than the discount brokers, such as Charles Schwab. Then there are the deep discount brokers, who offer fewer services. The extra money you pay a full-service broker entitles you to the brokerage firm's advice. As a rule, discount brokers don't offer advice. They just buy and sell on your instructions. Here you have another decision to make. Along with picking your first stock, you have to pick a broker. The best way to do this is to talk to several in your area, especially brokers who are recommended by your friends or relatives. If you don't like the first one you meet, there are plenty of others around. Some are very experienced and know a great deal about investing in stocks while others have just come out of a short training course and know very little. Having a good relationship with a broker is part of the fun of investing. Once you've settled on the broker's house and the broker, the next step is opening an account. If you're underage, the rules vary by state, have an adult open a custodial account with you. Now let's say you've given the broker whatever amount of money you've intended to invest and told the broker you're interested in Disney. A good full-service broker will punch up Disney on the special computer that brokers have and read you the recent news about the company. In addition, he or she will also give you the research reports on Disney prepared by their in-house expert or analyst who keeps tabs on the company. If they do their job right, analysts can be very valuable sources of information. It's possible that the analyst doesn't like Disney at the moment, or they think it's overpriced, or that low attendance at the theme parks will hurt the company. It's also possible that your broker will try to talk you out of Disney and into some other stock the brokerage house likes better. But if you've done your homework and you still think Disney is a good buy, then you might as well stick to your guns and insist on buying it. After all, it's your money. The next thing to consider is the price you want to pay for Disney. Again, you have a choice to make. You can buy a stock at the market which means you'll get whatever the price happens to be at the moment your order is sent to Wall Street. Or you can put in what's called a limit order for a specific price and hope somebody will take you up on it. That's the chance you take with limit orders. You're waiting to buy at a certain price, which you may or may not get. Let's say your broker has checked his computer and informed you that Disney is trading at $50 a share. You decide to put in your bid at the market. The broker transmits your order through the computer, and into the New York Stock Exchange, the NYSE. Today's big two stock markets are the New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, and the NASDAQ, which is pronounced NASDAQ. NASDAQ stands for the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotations. You can stump a lot of people on this one. What does NASDAQ stand for? because many professionals on Wall Street couldn't tell you. It's a mouthful, which is why you never hear anybody use the full name. The other name for the NASDAQ is the -the over-the-counter market. It used to be that companies that were too small to be listed on the regular stock exchanges, such as the New York Stock Exchange, sold their shares in neighborhood stock shops, where the deals were done across a counter. The counter is given way to the computer. Today, the NASDAQ handles companies large and small, from Microsoft to fledgling firms selling shares publicly for the first time. When you want to buy shares of a company that trades on the NASDAQ, say Microsoft, your broker sends your order into the NASDAQ computer system, where it shows up on a screen with all the other orders from people who want to buy or sell Microsoft. The NASDAQ market maker sits at a terminal in his or her office, which can be anywhere in the country, and puts the transactions together. Now let's get back to Disney. The day after you buy your shares of Disney, you will rush to the newspaper and open it to the business pages to find out how much it's worth. That's what shareholders do every morning. It's their first important activity. After they've taken a shower, brushed their teeth, put on their clothes, and poured themselves a cup of coffee. One way to tell who the investors are is by watching them read the paper. Investors don't start with the comics or sports or Ann Landers the way other readers do. They head straight for the business section and run their finger down the columns of stocks, 
searching for yesterday's closing prices on the companies they own. A lot of information is packed into that one tiny line in the newspaper. During business hours, when the stock exchanges are open and shares are changing hands at a rapid pace, the prices rise and fall minute by minute. But just before the closing bell rings at 4 p.m. and the trading stops, every stock has its last trade of the day. It's the price of this last trade, called the closing price, that gets quoted in the papers the next morning. That's what investors are looking for when they turn to the business section and scan those pages of numbers. You can also find the highest and lowest price your stock sold for in the last 12 months. Surprisingly, the average stock on the New York Stock Exchange moves up and down 50% from its base price in any given year. More incredible than that, one in every three stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange moves up and down 100% from the base price. A stock might start out the year selling for 12, rise to 16 during an optimistic stretch, and fall to 8 during a pessimistic stretch. That's a 100% move from 8 to 16. Clearly, some investors pay a lot less than others for the same company in the same year. You'll also notice that in the newspapers, stock prices are quoted in fractions instead of the usual decimals. So $37.75 becomes 37 and three quarters. This old-fashioned numbering system dates back to the Spaniards, who divided their money into eighths. That's why parrots in pirate movies are always squawking about pieces of eight. Wall Street has kept up the practice of doing its calculations in eighths. So instead of hearing such and such a stock is up 10 cents today, you're here it's up an eighth of a point. Instead of being up 25 cents, it's up a quarter of a point. A point is Wall Street tees for a dollar. The stock listings also show the high, low, last, and change, which gives you a recap of what happened in yesterday's trading. On a given day, the highest price anybody paid for Disney might be listed as 43 and 5 eighths, and the lowest was 43 and a quarter, and the last sale of the day was made at 43 and a half. That was the closing price that everybody's looking for in the newspaper. If it happened to be the same as the closing price from the prior day, there'd be a zero in the change column. From the newspaper, you can also see the dividend your company's paying, if any, the yield, that is, what percentage of return you're getting on your money, plus something called the P.E., the price earnings ratio. That's the price of a share divided by the annual earnings per share. When people are considering whether or not to buy a particular company, the P.E. helps them figure out if the stock is cheap or expensive. P.E. ratios vary from industry to industry, and to some extent from company to company. So the simplest way to use this tool is to compare a company's current P.E. ratio to what's normal for stocks at the time you want to invest. In today's market, the P.E. of the average stock is about 16, and Disney's P.E. of 21 makes it somewhat expensive relative to the average stock. There's also the word sales in the newspaper listing, the number of shares that were bought and sold in yesterday's session at the stock exchange. You always multiply this number times 100, so that 7114 tells you that more than 7.1 million shares of Disney changed hands. It's not crucial to know this, but it makes you realize that the stock market is a very, very busy place. When you add the three major exchanges, NYSE, American, and NASDAQ together, the volume of trading reaches half a billion shares a day. Thanks to home computers and the electronic ticker tape, people no longer have to wait for tomorrow's newspaper to check their stocks. During the day, they can watch the tape on TV or call up the stock prices on their computers or call an 800 number to get the prices right away. There's even a handheld cellular receiver that connects to a satellite that investors can carry anywhere on a rafting trip, an ocean cruise, or a mountain climbing expedition. All this technology has a drawback. It can get you too worked up about the daily gyrations. Letting your emotions go up and down in sympathy with stocks is a very exhausting form of exercise, and it doesn't do you any good. Whether Disney rises, falls, or goes sideways today, tomorrow, or next month isn't worth worrying about if you are a long-term investor. Stocks are very democratic. They have no prejudices. They don't care who they belong to, black or white, male or females, foreign or native, 
saint or sinner, it doesn't matter. It's not like a fancy country club, where before you can join, you'll have to pass the membership committee. If you want to buy a share and become an owner of a public company of your choice, the company can't stop you. And once you become a shareholder, they can never kick you out. If you own just one share of Disney, you enjoy the same rights and privileges as the owner of a million shares. You'll be invited to attend the annual meeting held at the original Disneyland in Anaheim, California, and you can sit next to the Wall Street pros and listen to the top Disney executives explain their strategy. You'll get free coffee and donuts and the chance to cast your vote on important matters, such as who will sit on the Disney Board of Directors. These directors are not employees of Disney, nor do they answer to the bosses of the company. They make strategic decisions, and they keep tabs on what the bosses are doing. Ultimately, the company exists for the shareholders, and the directors are there to represent the shareholders' interests. Public companies use a one-vote, one-share system in their elections. So if you own one share of Disney, your one vote isn't going to count for much against the million votes cast by people who own a million shares. Nevertheless, the company takes each vote quite seriously. It realizes that most shareholders can't interrupt their lives and travel to the annual meetings where important issues are decided, so it sends out absentee ballots. If you forget to fill yours out, they send you a reminder. Anytime you decide you don't like the management, its policies, or direction the company is headed, you are always free to exercise the ultimate no vote and sell your shares. Four times a year, you'll get the report card that tells you how the company is doing, how its sales are going, how much money it has made or lost in the latest period. Once a year, the company sends out the end report that sums up the year in great detail. Most of these are printed on fancy paper with several pages of photographs. It's easy to mistake them for an upscale magazine. In the front, there's a personal message from the head of the company, recounting the year's events, but the real story is in the numbers. These run on for several pages. Unless you are trained to read them, they may strike you as both confusing and dull. You can get the necessary training from a good accounting course. Once you do, these dull numbers can become very exciting indeed. What could be more exciting than learning to decipher a code that could make you a prosperous investor for life? Companies are required to send out all the reports. They can't say they forgot to write one or that the dog ate it along with the homework. They can't cancel the annual meeting or make up an excuse for not calling one. They can't hide the facts, no matter how unpleasant these facts may be. They must tell the whole truth, good and bad, so every shareholder knows exactly what's happening. It's the law. If there's a foul up on the assembly line, or products aren't selling, and the company is losing money, or the CEO runs off with the cash box, or somebody files a nasty lawsuit against it, the company must tell all. In politics, it's common practice for elected officials and candidates alike to stretch the truth, to bolster the point of view. When a politician distorts the facts, we say that's politics. But when a company distorts the facts, it's a scandal in Wall Street. But this rarely happens, in part because it's illegal to hide the truth about a publicly owned company. Corporations must file accurate documents with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which can impose legal sanctions. People who buy shares in Disney or Reebok or any other public company expect to make money from their investment. They count on firms to increase their profits, and they expect that a portion of these higher earnings will get back to them in the form of higher stock prices. This simple point, that the price of a stock is directly related to a company's earning power, is often overlooked, even by sophisticated investors. The ticker tape watchers begin to think stock prices have a life of their own. They try to fathom what the market is doing when they ought to be following the earnings of the companies whose stocks they own. If earnings continue to rise, the stock is destined to go up. Maybe it won't go up right away, but eventually it will rise. And if the earnings go down, it's a pretty safe bet the price of stock will go down. Lower earnings make a company less valuable, just like a rock band that loses its audience and stops selling records. This is the starting point for the successful stock picker. Find companies that can grow their earnings over many years to come. It's not by accident that stocks in general have had a total return of about 11% a year. It's because companies in general increase their earnings at 8% a year on average 
and pay 3% a year as a dividend. Based on these averages, the odds are in your favor when you invest in a representative sample of companies. Some will do better than others, but in general, they'll increase earnings by 8% a year and pay you a dividend of 3%, and you'll arrive at your 11% annual gain. By itself, the price of a stock doesn't tell you a thing about whether or not you're getting a good deal. You'll hear people say, I'm avoiding IBM, because at $100 a share, it's too expensive. It may be that they don't have $100 to spend on a share of IBM, but the price has nothing to do with whether or not IBM is expensive. A $150,000 Lamborghini is out of most people's price range, but for a Lamborghini, it may be a bargain. Likewise, $100 a share of IBM may not be expensive either. It depends on IBM's earnings. If IBM is earning $10 a share this year, then you're paying 10 times earnings when you buy a share for $100. That's a P.E. or price-to-earnings ratio of 10, which in today's market is cheap. On the other hand, if IBM is earning only a dollar a share, then you're paying 100 times earnings when you buy the stock at $100 a share. That's a P.E. ratio of 100, which is way too much to pay for IBM. The P.E. ratio is a complicated subject that merits further study, if you are serious about picking your own stocks. But while we're on the subject... Here are some pointers about PEs. If you take a large group of companies, add their stock prices together, and divide by their earnings, you get an average PE ratio. On Wall Street, they do this with the Dow Jones Industrials, the S&P 500, and other such indexes. The result is known as the market multiple, or what the market is selling for. The market multiple is a useful thing to be aware of, because it tells you how much investors are willing to pay for earnings at any given time. The market multiple goes up and down, but it tends to stay within the boundaries of 10 and 20. The stock market in late 1995 had an average P ratio of about 16. This tells us that today's stock prices are in the middle range. In other periods, the market P has fallen below 10. When that happens, stocks are very cheap. In general, the faster a company can grow earnings, the more investors will pay for those earnings. That's why aggressive young companies have P.E. ratios of 20 or 30 or higher. People are expecting great things for these companies and are willing to pay a higher price to own these shares. Older established companies have P.E. ratios in the mid to low teens. Their stocks are cheaper relative to earnings because established companies are expected to plod along and not do anything spectacular. Some companies steadily increase their earnings. They are the growth companies. Others are erratic earners, the rags to riches types. They are the cyclicals, the autos, the steels, the heavy industries that do well in certain economic climates. Their P.E. ratios are lower than the P.E.s of the steady growers because their performance is erratic. What they will earn from one year to the next depends on the condition of the economy, which is a very hard thing to predict. But just because a company earns a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean the stockholders will benefit. The next big question is, what does the company plan to do with this money? Basically, it has four choices. It can plow the money back into the business, in effect, investing in itself. It uses this money to open more stores or build new factories and grow its earnings even faster than before. In the long run, this is highly beneficial to the stockholders. A fast-growing company can take every dollar and make a 20% return on it. That's far more than you and I could get by putting that dollar in the bank. Or it can waste the money in corporate jets, teak panel offices, marble in the executive bathrooms, executive salaries that are double the going rate, or by buying other companies and paying too much for them. Such unnecessary purchases are bad for stockholders and can ruin what otherwise would be a very good investment. Or a company can buy back its own shares and take them off the market. Why would any company want to do such a thing? Because with fewer shares on the market, the remaining shares become more valuable. Share buybacks can be very good for the stockholders, especially if the company is buying itself at a cheap price. The final option with the earnings is for the company to pay a dividend. A majority of companies do this. Dividends are not entirely a positive thing. A company that pays one is admitting that it's not any longer a really fast-growing company. Otherwise, it would reinvest all the money. But in other ways, dividends are hard to beat. A dividend is a company's way of paying you to own the stock. The money gets sent to you directly on a regular basis. It's the only one of the four options 
where the cash goes into your pocket. If you need income while you're holding on to the stock, the dividend does the trick. Or you can use the dividend to buy more shares. Dividends also have a psychological benefit. In a bear market or a correction, no matter what happens to the price of the stock, you will still collect the dividend. This gives you an extra reason to not sell in a panic. Millions of investors buy dividend-paying stocks and nothing else. If you're interested in this kind of investing, you might want to get in touch with Moody's Investors Services, a Wall Street research firm. Among other things, Moody's compiles a list of companies that have raised a dividend for many years in a row. A few have been doing it for over 50 years, and more than 300 have been raising their dividend for 10 years. The list appears in Moody's Handbook of Dividend Achievers, along with complete statistical rundowns of each of the companies that have gotten into this habit. If you are going to invest in a stock, you have to know the story. This is another area where investors get themselves in trouble. They buy a stock without knowing the story, and they track the stock price because that's the only detail they understand. When the price goes up, they think the company's in great shape. But when the price stalls out or goes down, they get bored or they lose faith, so they sell their shares. Confusing the price with the story is the biggest mistake an investor can make. It causes people to bail out of stocks during crashes and corrections, when the prices are at their lowest, when they think the companies they own must be in lousy shape. It causes them to miss the chance to buy more shares when the price is low, when the company is about to hit a stretch of record profits. The story is what's happening inside the company to produce the profits in the future or the losses. It's not always easy to figure this out. Some stories are more complicated than others. Companies that have many different divisions are harder to follow than companies that make a single product. Even when the story is simple, it may not be conclusive. But there are occasions when the picture is clear and the average investor is in a perfect position to see how beautiful it is. There are times when understanding a company can really pay off. Let's consider two examples from two different periods, Nike in 1987 and Johnson & Johnson in 1994. Nike is a simple business. It makes sneakers. Along with fast food and specialty retailers, this is the sort of story that anybody can follow. There are three key elements. First, is Nike selling more sneakers this year than last year? Second, Is it making a decent profit on the sneakers it sells? Third, will it sell more sneakers next year and the year after? In 1987, investors got some definite answers, which arrived in the quarterly reports and the end reports sent to every shareholder. Since going public in 1980, Nike's stock had been bouncing all over the place, jumping from $5 in 1984 to $10 in 1986, falling back to $5, then finally rebounding to $10 in 1986. Looking at the scenery for this story, the prospects for sneakers could not have been brighter. Everybody was wearing them. Toddlers, teenagers, even adults who hadn't worn sneakers since they were kids. There were different sneakers for tennis, jogging, basketball, you name it. It was obvious that the demand for sneakers was growing, and Nike was a big supplier. Yet the company had run into a rough stretch where its sales, earnings, and future sales were all declining. This was a very depressing story as shareholders found out when they received their first quarter 1987 report. As is the custom with many companies, Nike's year begins in June, so the first quarter of 1987 ends in August of 1986. If you own Nike, you got the news in the mail in early October 1986. Sales down 22%, earnings down 38%, and futures, future orders, down 39%. This was not a good time to buy more shares of Nike. The second quarter report was mailed out on January 6th, 1987. The results were just as bad as the first quarter, and the third quarter wasn't much better. Then, lo and behold, in the fourth quarter report, which arrived in late July 1987, along with the end report, there was a positive note. Sales were still down, but only by 3%. Earnings were still down, but future orders had turned up. This meant that stores around the world were buying more Nike sneakers. They wouldn't be ordering more sneakers unless they thought they could sell a lot more Nikes. By reading the end report of that year, you would have also had learned that in spite of several quarters of declining earnings, Nike was still making a nice profit. That's because sneakers are a very low-cost business. It's not like the steel business, 
we have to build and maintain expensive factories. The sneaker business, all you need is a big room and a bunch of sewing machines and relatively inexpensive materials. Nike had plenty of cash on hand and was in excellent financial shape. When you opened the first quarter report of 1988, which arrived in late September 1987, you could hardly believe your eyes. Sales were up 10%, earnings up 68%, and future orders up 61%. This was positive proof that Nike was on a roll. In fact, the roll lasted for five more years, 20 straight quarters of higher sales and higher earnings. In September 1987, you didn't know yet about the 20 straight quarters. You were happy the company had turned itself around, but you weren't rushing out to buy more stock. You were worried about the price, which had just recently moved up sharply from 7 to $12.50. So you waited for future developments, and this time you got very lucky. Stock prices came tumbling down in the crash of October 1987. Investors who confused the stock price with a story were selling everything they owned, including their Nike shares. They heard commentators on the nightly news predict a worldwide collapse of the financial markets. In the midst of this pandemonium, you kept your head because you realized the Nike story was getting better. The crash gave you a gift, the opportunity to buy more of Nike at a bargain price. The stock dropped to $7 a share after the crash and sat at that level for eight days, so you had plenty of time to call your broker. From there, it began a five-year climb to 90, while the story kept getting better. You could have bought Nike at several different points along the way. By the end of 1992, Nike shares were worth 12 times more than what you paid for them in October 1987. I missed this phenomenal buying opportunity in Nike. But a recent example of a clear-cut story that any investor could have understood was Johnson & Johnson, and I was lucky enough to get on to this one. This is a story that does not take any particular genius to figure out. If you had seen the 1993 annual report, you would have arrived at the same conclusion. Invest in this company. The 1993 annual report was mailed out on March 10, 1994. The first thing you noticed on the inside cover was the fate of the stock over the past couple of years. It had been dropping steadily from $57 at the end of 1991. At the time the report arrived, the stock had fallen to 39 and 5 eighths. For such a great company to have produced such a lousy stock in a rising market, you suspected something was wrong. You scanned the end report for the bad news, but everywhere you looked, there was good news. Much of it was summarized on page 42, which revealed that the earnings had gone up steadily for 10 years in a row, and had quadrupled during that period. The sales had risen steadily as well. The company also mentioned it had raised the dividend 10 years in a row but neglected to mention a more incredible fact. It had raised the dividend for 31 years in a row. Perhaps Johnson Johnson was just trying to be modest. Also on page 42, you learn that the company had become more productive in recent years. In 1983, Johnson Johnson manufactured and sold $6 billion worth of products with 77,400 employees, while in 1993, it manufactured and sold $14 billion worth of products with 81,600 employees. That's more than twice as much manufacturing and selling with only 4,200 extra employees. From 1989 to 1993, sales increased from $9 billion to over $14 billion, and the number of employees dropped. This told you that Johnson Johnson was getting to be highly efficient and adept at cutting costs. The company had created a situation where the workers were using their time more effectively. They are producing more value for the company, for the shareholders, and for themselves, although you couldn't see it in the stock price. Many of the workers owned shares, and even if they didn't, when sales went up and profits went up, they got raises. On pages 25 and 42, you found out that Johnson Johnson had been buying back its own shares, 3 million shares in 1993, 110 million shares in the last decade. It spent billions of dollars in this effort. When a company takes its own shares off the market in this fashion, the investors are likely to benefit. Fewer shares means higher earnings per share, which leads to a higher stock price. Looking at Johnson Johnson's stock price, you wouldn't think there had been a buyback. The balance sheet showed that the company had cash and marketable securities worth $900 million and total equity of $5.5 billion. Its long-term debt was only $1.5 billion, a modest amount for a company 
with $5.5 billion in equity. With this much financial clout, Johnson & Johnson was not going out of business anytime soon. By this time, you're wondering, what's the flaw in the story? Could it be that J&J hadn't prepared itself for the future? The headline on the cover of the end report suggested otherwise. Right there in big letters, it said, Growth for new products. The text gave the details. 34% of the company's 1993 sales came from products introduced into the market in the last five years. Again, on page 42 of their annual report, you discover that Johnson & Johnson spent more than $1 billion on research and development in 1993, 8% of total sales. The R&D budget had more than doubled in 10 years. Obviously, the company was doing what the headline said, growing new products. It hadn't been caught napping. To put this story into a larger context, you compared the price of the stock to the earnings. The company was expected to earn $3.10 in 1994, giving it a price-earnings ratio of 12. Future earnings are always hard to predict, but J&J had very predictable results in the past. So if these estimates turned out to be correct, the stock was cheap. J&J was far better than your average company. It was a terrific company, doing everything right. Earnings up, sales up, future prospects bright. Despite all this, stock already had dropped to 39.5 ace, and it dropped further to 36 in the weeks after the report arrived. At the time, the average stock was selling for 16 times its estimated 1994 earnings. Johnson Johnson was selling for only 11 times its estimated 1994 earnings. As hard as it was to believe, you reached the inescapable conclusion there was nothing wrong with Johnson Johnson to cause the stock price to go down. The company wasn't the problem. The healthcare scare was the problem. In 1993, Congress was debating various health care reform proposals, including the ones advanced by the Clinton administration. Investors worried that health care companies would suffer if the Clinton proposals became law. So they dumped J&J along with the rest of the other health care stocks. The entire industry took a beating in this period. Some of this concern would have been justified if the Clintons had their way, because health care companies like Johnson Johnson might have had their earnings clipped. But even then, J&J would have been affected less than the typical health care company. On page 42 of the annual report, you learn that over 50% of J&J's profits came from its international operations. The Clinton proposals couldn't have affected those. Then on page 24, you found out that 24% of the company's profits came from shampoo, band-aids, and other consumer items that had nothing to do with pharmaceuticals, which the Clintons had targeted for reform. Either way you sliced it, J&J had limited exposure to the threat that people were worried about. It didn't take more than 20 minutes to read the end report and decide that J&J was one of the bargains of the decade. Johnson Johnson is not a complicated story. You didn't have to be a full-time professional investor or graduate of the Harvard Business School to figure it out. This was an easy call. The stock was down while the fundamentals of the company were improving. As in the case of Nike, you didn't have to rush out to buy shares. I recommended J&J in an article in USA Today at the end of 1993 when the stock was selling for 44 and 7 eighths. Later, the stock went down, but that didn't bother me. Here's a chance to buy more shares at even a lower price. By midsummer 1994, the stock had rebounded to 44. It was still cheap on earnings. In 1995, it rose well above $85 a share. The price had more than doubled in 18 months. Even if you've done your homework and picked good stocks, the market can have its own momentum, challenging you to hang in there for the long haul. In a normal day of trading, many stocks will go up in price while others will go down. But occasionally there's a stampede when the prices of thousands of stocks are running in the same direction, like the bulls at Pamplona. If the stampede is uphill, we call it a bull market. When the bulls are having their run, sometimes 9 out of 10 stocks are hitting new highs every week. People are rushing around buying as many shares as they can afford. They talk to their brokers more often than they talk to their best friends. Nobody wants to miss out on a good thing. As long as the good thing lasts, millions of shareholders go to bed happy and wake up happy. They sing in the shower, whistle while they work, help old ladies across the street, and count their blessings every night as they put themselves to sleep, reviewing the gains in their portfolios. But a bull market doesn't last forever. Sooner or later, the stampede will turn downhill. Stock prices will drop with 9 out of 10 stocks hitting new lows every week. 
People who are anxious to buy on the way up will become more anxious to sell on the way down. On the theory that any stock sold today will fetch a better price than it would fetch tomorrow. When stock prices fall over 10% from their most recent peak, it's called a correction. We've had 53 corrections in this century, or about one every two years on average. When stock prices fall 25% or more, it's called a bear market. Of the 53 corrections, 15 have turned into bear markets. 15 in 95 years is on average about once every six years. Nobody knows who coined the term bear market, but having their name linked to financial losses is unfair to bears. There are no bears within 50 miles of Wall Street, unless you count the bears in the New York zoos. And the bears do not dive off peaks the way stocks do in a bear market. You can make a better case for calling a bear market a lemming market, in honor of the investors who sell their stocks because everyone else is selling. An extended bear market can test everybody's patience and unsettle the most experienced investors. No matter how good you are at picking stocks, your stocks will go down. And just when you think the bottom has been reached, they'll go down even some more. If you own mutual funds, you won't do much better, because the mutual funds will go down as well. Their fate is tied to the stocks they own. People who bought stocks at the high in 1929, this was a small group fortunately, had to wait 25 years to break even on the prices. Imagine your stocks being in the red for a quarter of a century. From the high point in 1969, before the crash of 1973-1974, it took seven years to break even. Perhaps we'll never see another bear market as severe as the one in 1929. That one was prolonged by the Depression. But we can't ignore the possibility of another bear market of the 1973-1974 variety, when stock prices are down long enough for a generation of children to get through elementary school. Investors can't avoid corrections in bear markets any more than northerners can avoid snowstorms. In 50 years of owning stocks, you can expect roughly 25 corrections. Eight or nine will turn into bears. Since we're all accustomed to taking action to protect ourselves from snowstorms and hurricanes, it's natural that we should try to take action to protect ourselves from bear markets, even though this is in one case where being prepared like a Boy Scout is a mistake. Far more money has been lost by investors trying to anticipate corrections than has been lost in all the corrections combined. One of the worst mistakes you can make is to switch in and out of stocks or stock mutual funds, hoping to avoid the upcoming correction. It's also a mistake to sit on your cash and wait for the upcoming correction before you invest in stocks. In trying to time the market to sidestep the bears, people often miss out on the chance to run with the bulls. Starting in 1965, if you were unlucky and invested your $2,000 at the peak of the market in each successive year, your annual return was 10.6%. If you timed the market perfectly and invested your $2,000 at the low point of the market in each year, your annual return was 11.7%. So the difference between great timing and lousy timing was only 1.1%. Of course, you'd like to be lucky and make that extra 1.1%. But you'll do just fine with lousy timing, as long as you stay invested with stocks. Buy shares in good companies and hold on to them through thick and thin. There's an easy solution to the problem of bear markets. Set up a schedule of buying stocks or stock mutual funds so you're putting in a small amount of money every month or four months or six months. This will remove you from the drama of the bulls and the bears. Every year, Forbes magazine prints a list of the 400 richest humans in the United States. This issue is as popular with the business crowd as the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue is with the sports crowd. It makes for interesting reading because it tells you who these people are and what made them so rich, and also how the country has changed over the years. When Forbes first published its list in 1982, the number one spot was held by Daniel K. Ludwig, the shipping tycoon. Five of the top ten were in the Hunt family that drilled Texas full of holes and hit lots of gushers, which reminds us of billionaire J. Paul Getty's purported advice on how to get ahead in the world. Rise early, work hard, strike oil. This original list from 14 years ago is crawling with Rockefellers and DuPonts, a Frick, a Whitney, a Mellon or two, all of the great family fortunes that stretch back to the 19th century. The word inheritance 
appears in the biographical blurbs no less than 65 times. In addition to the 65 heirs, there are at least 12 sons and daughters who held positions of influence in ongoing family enterprises. A Mars from Mars Candy Bars, a Disney, a Bush of the Beer Bushes, and a Johnson of Johnson & Johnson. There weren't as many old money fortunes on the 1993 list as there were in the 1980s, which leads to a couple conclusions about wealth in America. First, it's not easy to hold on to money, even among billionaires. Inheritance taxes put a big dent into any large fortune that's handed down from one generation to the next. Unless the heirs are careful and invest wisely, they can lose their millions as fast as their ancestors made them. Second, America is still the land of opportunity, where smart young people like Bill Gates and Microsoft can end up on the Forbes list ahead of the Rockefellers, the Mellons, the Gettys, and the Carnegies. Just ahead of Gates on the 1993 list in the number one position is Warren Buffett, who made his $10 billion doing what you're interested in doing, or you wouldn't still be listening, picking stocks. Buffett was the first stock picker in history to reach the top. Buffett follows a simple strategy, no tricks, no gimmicks, no playing the market, just buying shares in good companies and holding on to them until it gets very boring. The results are far from boring. $10,000 invested with Warren Buffett 40 years ago is worth $80 million today. Most of these gains came from stocks and companies you've heard of, and you could buy for yourself, such as Coca-Cola, Gillette, and the Washington Post. If you ever begin to doubt that owning stocks is a smart thing to do, remember Warren Buffett. F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote in his novel, The Great Gatsby, the rich are different from you and me, but you could not prove it by reading the Forbes list. It turns out there are all kinds of rich people, short, fat, tall, skinny, good-looking, homely, high IQ, not so high IQ, big spenders, penny pinchers, tight-fisted, and generous. No reason a rich person couldn't be exactly like you. But even if you don't want to become wealthy, investing in stocks will put you on the road to prosperity. Just remember, start now, have a plan, do your homework, and hang in there for the long term. Thank you.